Star Trek Picard, Season 3, Episode 5. Ironically named Imposters. Because I see a lot of characters running around who seem to be the same characters that I used to watch on TNG. But when I look a little closer, I can see they're definitely imposters. <laughs> We're back on the Titan again. And we start out with Jack and he's wearing a Starfleet uniform. He is on the bridge and he's shooting all of the bridge crew. Why he's shooting the bridge crew, I don't know. Oh, except it turns out he was hallucinating. And he's, he's seeing all this, this red stuff growing all over the place. And his eyes glow red. As I said, it was just a hallucination. Everybody's fine. He wasn't actually going around shooting everybody. The next thing we hear is Riker. And he is actually entering a captain's log, which is something that I haven't heard in a very long time. A proper captain's log entry. So that was that was nice. However, on that dark bridge, it looks like Discovery or Strange New Worlds or Take Your Pick. It just this still isn't Star Trek, no matter what people want to say. You can put these imposters out there all you want. Actors who played the original characters, but they're still not. Picard is up there with Riker. He's asking, how did a changeling get on this ship? Riker turns command back over to Shaw, which frankly Whatever. Shaw gleefully tells everybody that he already contacted Starfleet and that he's basically looking forward to them getting arrested. He reinstates Seven in this very mocking ceremony. Do you want to be reinstated or not for this? I guess for the investigation. And she's like reinstated. Then he does like this religious hand gesture. I'm going to preface this again. I don't know the actor who plays Shaw. He might be a wonderful, wonderful person. But this character, Captain Shaw, I was telling Molly, when he's delivering his lines, his character, it's like he's drunk. He, he's walking around making these just odd comments, the way he says stuff. The Shaw character, I do not like. I did not like him in this episode. I haven't liked him in any of the episodes. I do not like Shaw. And now we've decided, after a long conversation... That he's Jim Leahy from the Trailer Park Boys. He's this drunken Trailer Park supervisor just walking around, slurring around, and just making weird comments. I don't like Captain Shaw at all. He's unprofessional. I didn't like any of his dialogue, save maybe toward the very, very end of this episode. Yeah, uh, the character was written as an over-the-top dick. I'm sure that the actor is performing at top level for what he was contracted to do. However, the character in and of himself, is a bad character for Star Trek. To be in a captain's position, it's just, it's ridiculous. Shaw tells Picard and company that, oh, he's going to give them some time to get their bullshit story straight. So they're, they're trying to make this edgy, and it's just coming off as, I don't want to say trying too hard, but I've seen people say that this is their attempt at trying to humanize these characters. And it's like, but I don't watch Star Trek so that I can see common people acting like dicks. I watch Star Trek for things like philosophy. I'll just go through the story and then I'll pick this up at the end because I have a lot more to say that ties in with some other stuff. So I'll just keep going. The quick comment I want to make here is as we were watching this, the first question that came to my mind was, what are they doing the investigation for? Riker and Picard are in trouble. In trouble for what? And then we were talking and it's like, oh, well, Seven was talked into redirecting the ship to the frontier where Beverly Crusher was. So Picard is a retired admiral. I don't understand how he could be gone after for anything. He's retired. Shaw even pointed that out. I suppose maybe Riker you could go after for abusing his authority to a subordinate. But I was struggling to figure out what exactly they were going after. The explanation, I think, was hijacking the Titan. They didn't hijack anything. They talked Seven to go to a different destination while Shaw was sleeping. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, what exactly Picard and company are being charged with. So anyway, so Picard tells his little group there that he's going to take the blame for everything. And it's like, oh, okay. So 
Next, we see Beverly. She wants to examine the changeling because she wants to know how it evaded sensors. Then Picard tries to recruit Jack to join Starfleet, which seems like a dumbass thing if I ever did see one. Why would Jack ever join Starfleet? That just was ridiculous and just seemed to come out of nowhere. After that, Rafi and Worf are back, (laughs) and they're sparring. Worf had reached out to his handler because they're trying to figure out what else was stolen from Daystrom, because obviously that portal thing was just a diversion, which, okay, whatever. So anyways, his request to know what else was stolen is denied. It's an obvious cover-up, so okay, whatever. And Rafi gets all bent out of shape. Worf says to stand down. Rafi... She wants to break in to find out what exactly was stolen from Daystrom. They need to know who exactly was in Sneed's orbit so that they know who he was working with. And Worf knows somebody, somebody named Kryn, that they're going to reach out to to see if they can find out anything. They go to District 6 of Metallus Prime. They're walking through the streets and like everybody's disappearing. And Rafi, she's confused. And, and Worf said that they're now the alphas of District 6. You know, after Worf went through and cut Sneed's head off right there while everybody was watching. So anyway, so Worf just kneels down and starts meditating in the middle of the street, waiting for the ecology of District 6 to write itself. Meanwhile, Rafi is shouting at the empty streets and any of the people hiding that they're looking for Kryn. <sighs> then the USS Intrepid shows shows up uh, at the Titan. They're there for Picard and Riker. And they're sending a shuttle over instead of using the transporters. Shaw is all chipper because he is thrilled to see Picard getting what he apparently believes Picard has coming to him. He was standing there in the turbo lift singing or humming. It was, again, he comes across like he's drunk and he's just doing these bizarre things. So then he goes into a list of all the screw-ups, or at least his idea of what Picard's screw-ups were in the past. Picard's response saying to Riker, those were the days. And that was one of the scenes we saw in the trailer before the season started. So who comes over on the shuttle from the Intrepid but Ro Laren? Somehow, she has managed to get reinstated into Starfleet, and now she's apparently with Starfleet Intelligence. The last time we saw her, she had left Starfleet to join the Maquis. So this is the second time she has been brought back into Starfleet after being arrested and tossed in jail. So apparently she's just been rehabilitated again and welcomed back. So how many times can you commit treason yourself and be reinstated. So it takes all the bite out of the treason that Picard is going to be facing because it's like, well, pff, I guess he can just rehabilitate himself because how many years of jail does it take to get rehabilitated? Yeah, but what treason? That's what I don't understand. What treason? I understand unofficially what she's questioning, which Molly hasn't gotten to yet. But officially, what treason? He was a retired admiral. If anybody is on the hook... For any big problems here, it's Seven of Nine, possibly Captain Riker, who would have given an order to a subordinate. I don't see how Picard is in any way responsible for any of this stuff. Yeah, the whole situation is so ridiculous. You watch this stuff and it's like, you could at least try to not seem absurd. Because this is absurd. Like, you just pointed out, why treason? And it's like... Because they wanted to up the drama. This was all about drama. What is treason? Picard did not do anything. He's a retired admiral. Even Riker. What treasonous act did they do? They didn't. They talked Seven into going to a different location and grabbing a shuttlecraft. I'm not sure what that charge would be, but I don't think that's treason. They didn't do anything to sell themselves on, at least above board. Now, later, Molly's going to talk about stuff underneath that might explain a bit more of these charges and what the allegations are. But that's not, at this point in the story, we are going above board based on what we've seen in these four episodes. And I didn't see any treason in those episodes. Yeah, so that treason nonsense, that completely breaks the suspension of disbelief because it's just so over-the-top stupid. Ugh. So, anyway... 
Seven is trying to hide Jack, so she gives him a uniform to put on, which looks just like the one he was wearing in his vision earlier when he was going through the bridge and shooting all the crew. Beverly, she is doing an alien autopsy on the changeling. She has Ensign LaForge verify that that's not her dead on the table. And, of course, it's not. So Ensign LaForge turns around and throws up on the floor. I mean, that was that was a great Star Trek moment. That was supposed to be a joke. Crusher was narrating about saying she needed confirmation from LaForge. The confirmation was LaForge turning and puking. And then Crusher said, oh, I guess that's confirmation or something like that. It was supposed to be a ha-ha funny joke. I didn't laugh. I thought it was stupid. Didn't belong in Star Trek. Very true. She's doing her alien autopsy on the changeling, and the changeling, even though it's dead, didn't revert back to its liquid form. It has blood-like plasma, but no DNA, apparently. So it would have passed the sensor test as far as detecting a changeling goes. So next, we're with Picard, and he's angry at Ro Laren. And this goes back to the last time we saw her on TNG. Yeah, I think the episode was called Preemptive Strike. It was the episode right before the series finale. So it was right at the end of the series because we looked in IMDb to make sure Roe didn't appear in any other Star Treks. We didn't see anything else in IMDb. So this Preemptive Strike episode was the last time we saw Roe. After we go through the recap of what happened in this episode, after that, we will have an in-depth discussion about that episode, Preemptive Strike, from The Next Generation, versus what we saw between Ro Laren and Jean-Luc Picard in this episode. So, Ro starts transferring crew off of the Titan and onto the Intrepid. That seemed kind of bizarre, but whatever. They explain later why that was, but... Again, at the time when we're watching this, it's just really weird what's going on. I don't know a nice thing to say about what was happening with the crew transfer at the time, except why are you doing that? And some would argue, well, there's a reason. You'll find out later on in the episode. Okay, but right now, I'm not worried about the later in the episode. I'm trying to figure out what's happening right now. I mean, go ahead and continue, my. I just... <laughs> this episode... There was potential for some stuff here, but whenever they got some momentum going, they would do things that would just completely derail whatever they were trying to do. Well, I think that's because a lot of this was just trying to up the suspense and the drama. It wasn't about telling a good story or even a coherent story at times. It was just all about the feels, and I'm just I'm sick to death of that crap. Picard and Roe are alone. She cuts her hand to try to show that she isn't a changeling. However, she isn't wearing her earring. So that was like a red flag going up for Picard. Because why would Rolaren be caught dead without her Bajoran earring on? So anyway, she wants to talk all about Jack. And again, that seems to be another red flag because the changelings are just so interested in Jack. Oh, so then we go to Jack and he is having a meltdown. He goes to the transporter room. His eyes are glowing red and he, he begs to be transported anywhere other than the Intrepid. And of course, they can't do that because where else would they send him? He imagines that he's shooting the ensign that he's talking to and it's clear that There's something really, really wrong with Jack. So we're back with Rafi and Worf. So this Kryn person shows up. Kryn is a Vulcan. He is a Vulcan crime boss. And he had a stereotypical mobster-like voice. What is this, Al Pacino or something? It reminded me of that soap opera that you watch. That has that guy who's been that mobster for decades. General Hospital and Sonny Corinthos. That's who it reminded me of. (laughs) Well, they might be watching too much of that because uh, Sonny was the guy who shot his own son, except he didn't know it was his son. And then the baby mama burst in and said, yeah, you just shot your own son. Anyway, (laughs) it, it turns out that Rafi is wearing a mobile emitter. So she's not actually there. She's situated somewhere up above with a... uh, I think she was supposed to be a sniper that was up there. 
But she was so incompetent, she got caught, so it didn't really matter. Yeah, that was that was dumb. We're back with Beverly doing her alien autopsy. She is pulling out the guts of this changeling because apparently they've evolved to the point where they can mimic human organs and things. And unless you cut out the organs and really start cutting into them, they won't revert back to goo. I, I don't even know what to say about that other than isn't that convenient? And a part of me is kind of like, oh, so did Jack get some sort of, oh, I don't know, organ transplant or some crap when he was a little kid and he's got changeling parts inside of him and that's what's going on and making him all mental? I've got a theory about this that I'm going to share after this is all done. I've got a few theories I'm going to guess about where this series is going, but we'll save that till later in the video. So they could be anyone and they would never know because these changelings apparently are just so good at being mimics of humans now. But this scene with all the blood and the guts all over and it was just like, really? Really? This is Star Trek now. Alien autopsies. Great. That's that's fantastic. Don't worry. They're going to get Baltar and he's going to create a Cylon detector and we're going to get this all figured out. So don't worry. Oh, God. Ugh. So anyway, so Picard is still in his his meeting with Ro Laren or interrogation or whatever you want to call it. So Beverly contacts him and he tells Ro that he has to check on these medical results. So he goes over and looks at the screen and Beverly says, oh, the changelings can pass the blood test now and trust no one. Which again goes back to the, the trailer. Trust no one in that first episode. Trust no one. Trust no one. Just boiling all of this stuff down to this one catchphrase. Can't we do anything a little bit more complicated than that? Trust no one. No, Star Trek, ever since J.J. Abrams, is all about conspiracies, dark government agencies, and just doing this sort of stuff. That's what Star Trek is now, has been since 2009. That first movie, maybe you got away with that not being the center of it. But starting with Darkness on, this episode, I was telling Molly, Alex Kurtzman wanted a Section 31 series with Michelle Yeoh. He didn't get that. But he's making his Section 31 series with Picard Season 3. Well done. This is Star Trek now. So now he really doesn't trust Ro. And he's asking her how she got let back into Starfleet. And she says she turned herself in and she was court-martialed. She went through some sort of extreme rehabilitation. And Bob's your uncle. She's back in Starfleet. Not only that, she's in Starfleet Intelligence. And again, they used her because she has all this experience with terrorists. And it's kind of like, yeah, the last time you did that, she went out and joined them. So why in the hell would you get her out to do this again? If they have charges of treason. Again, with these changelings, the whole concept here is that the changelings are causing all these investigations to get real people out of positions. But if you're worried about treason, why would you hire somebody who already had a sketchy past? The last time Picard knew her, she jumped ship. She, If you want to talk treason, that was a pretty close indicator that she wasn't going to be loyal to the Starfleet. <laughs> This whole storyline with Roe coming back was ridiculous. It's a shame because Molly's going to talk in a little bit. There was one scene coming up here with her and Picard that was actually good. I don't mean good for Picard this season. I mean actually good. Like a two-minute window of a good scene in this. Yes, I'm giving a compliment, but Molly will get to that in a minute. Yeah, so... Picard asks her why she joined the enemy and betrayed her honor. She says, you mean betrayed Starfleet? And then she talks about how you shouldn't have blind faith in any institution, yada, yada, yada. And then she asks about the changeling. And Picard says they don't know anything about it because they killed it. And she says she wants to see it. So they're going through the hallway to go see the dead changeling. And she pulls a phaser on Picard and tells him to step into the holodeck. Inside the holodeck, 10 forward is still running. Like this whole time, it's just apparently been running because I didn't see her activate it or him turn it on or anything like that. Nope, just the doors open and there was 10 forward. The crisis is over with the ship. The last episode, 
created that holodeck program. So I guess they had a safe space people could go to. And it was still running. Out of all the places, there was nobody left in there because they didn't need their safe space anymore. So I'm convinced, and Molly and I talked about this, they have that 10 forward set. And they're going to use that every time they get a chance. It's just... That's the only reason whenever they go back into the holodeck, it's 10 forward or the LA bar, not the Enterprise D bar. They're going to keep reusing that for the rest of the season. I They paid for it. They're going to use it. So she locks them in and he goes behind the bar and asks her if she wants anything to drink. He pulls out a phaser on her. So they're both standing there with phasers on each other. And there was a panel under the bar, like a touch screen that had a It said safety protocols on or off, and he hit them off or disabled, whatever the menu was. I scratched my head at that and said, okay, whatever. I I didn't understand why that panel would just be lit up in there. He didn't call for it in any way that was useful. Maybe we didn't see what he was doing with his hands. But, yeah, he had to shut off the safety protocols, and then somehow he was using... I guess Guinan's phaser that was in the bar, but because the safety protocols were off, now he had a real phaser and he was going to threaten her. Because the story necessitated it, that's why. That's it. There's no other reason. And that's one of the things I hate about this show and writing right now in particular is that they'll just include stupid things like that just because they need for that to happen to move their plot along. They're not cleverly writing this stuff and planning it out. Roe gave verbal commands to the computer in the holodeck. So much like we've seen in all of TNG, that's how the holodeck still works. Picard wasn't at the arch. He was under the bar, and it looked like an old school, well, old school as in a normal LCD type display that had disabled the safety protocols. And why would that exist there? I didn't understand at all why that was a thing. He didn't Verbal commands were still a thing in the holodeck, but apparently now there's there's panels that aren't on the arch that you can use anywhere in the simulation to change stuff. I just, you know, went with it. I said, fine, whatever. How convenient. So anyway, he starts talking to her about her earring and talking about the first time she came on board the Enterprise, etc. And then he is chewing her out in Bajoran, and she comments that his Bajoran has gotten a lot better over the years. And he said he's been rehearsing this conversation for 30 years. And it's like, really? (sighs) She says she joined the Maquis to fight injustice, even if it meant betraying Starfleet. They talk about confusing morality with duty. Picard then tells her, you broke my heart. And Rose says, and you broke mine. And she puts her phaser down and he puts his phaser down. And after that, they believe they are who they said they are. So then Picard asks, why are you here, Ro? And then she says, Starfleet is compromised. Then she asks, do you trust me? And he says he does. And again, I mean, you broke my heart. I mean, that was just such a godfather kind he of moment. He should have grabbed her and like kissed her, you know, mobster style to put the hit down on her. It was... Yeah, yeah. I mean, parts of this, I mean, we'll get to this at the end and talk about this, especially after we rewatched Preemptive Strike right before we watched this episode, because we wanted to make sure that we had it fresh in our heads as to what happened back then. And we will talk about the comparison of what happened there and what happened in this episode after we're done with the recap here. But to give credit, this is where I said there was a moment in this episode that I thought was a good scene. And it was in the holodeck when them two were talking after the mobster talk. And they they were actually exchanging thoughts about things for like a couple of minutes. I actually did enjoy that. I actually did enjoy that. It felt like that might have been a continuation of what was going on after preemptive strike. But the stuff leading up to it and around it, I mean, you have to just take that clip and just say it is what it is out of the context. Because in context, oh my gosh, this was so ridiculous setting up stuff. Yeah, but we'll get to that at the end of the recap here. So then we cut to Worf and Rafi and that Vulcan mobster. And he is telling them that he grew up with Sneed in Sector 7. They were both scavengers. So I'm like, what? This was some sort of street urchin Vulcan? Now he is some sort of 
criminal mastermind. And he's talking about how loyalty is what passes for family here. And I'm like, oh no. So then he's telling us that there is no utopia without crime and that an organized criminal enterprise is logical. That line pissed me off. This dark, dystopian environment. I don't want to go into a political discussion, real life political discussion. But ever since Deep Space Nine, there's been this, you gotta have Section 31, you gotta have this, you gotta have that, this utopia doesn't come for free. And in my opinion, it's eroded away what Star Trek was. Look what we have now. We've got Section 31s, we got a Vulcan saying it's logical in a utopia to have crime. All I can think of is why? If Everybody is post-scarcity and they have replicators. Why do you need crime? That is the opposite of logical. We can discuss that at the end as well, because, uh, yeah, that, that deserves a much larger discussion. And it's unfortunate. That's not something we're ever going to get in this show. So this logical Vulcan wants Rafi and Worf to fight each other to the death. Worf says that sacrifice is needed this is the fight we saw in the trailer of what appeared to be Rafi and Worf fighting each other. So Rafi stabs Worf. He is telling Rafi that today was a good day to die. Member Barry! And that she is a warrior and this is a worthy death. I'm just like, oh, well, that's all well and good, but he's not really dead. <laughs> Not to mention this isn't really Worf anyway. I mean, this is the closest approximation, I think, of an actual character from TNG, but still not Worf. I thought Riker at the beginning, the first episode, he was pretty close. But then after he blamed Picard for everybody dying, like, yeah, that's not Riker now. <laughs> Riker sunk the Titanic himself, and then he blamed Picard for it. He so did. that was not Will Riker. That was secret hideout. Billy Ricker. And the funny thing is, we had a person in the comments a couple of days ago mention this. If Riker would have been a changeling, then maybe this would have made more sense, his weird behavior. Yeah. But I don't think Riker is a changeling. I just think the writers didn't know how to write Will Riker after a certain point. Yep. So, Rafi stabs Worf, and he's laying on the ground, and he appears to be dead. And I'm like, no, he's not really dead. Because... He's bleeding all over the place, too. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, one of one of this Vulcan's minions checks him out, and they're like, oh, there's no heartbeat. And so a Vulcan criminal thinks that he's won. But now we're back with Rowan Picard. She's telling him that apparently changelings have infiltrated every level of Starfleet. She's worried about how many there are on the Intrepid because they've been having transporter problems, all this other nonsense, and that apparently there have been... 12 changeling incidents on different starships. And she is worried about Founder's Day because the full fleet is going to be on display and that the security plans are classified. So she hasn't been able to access what the security plans are for Frontier Day. The Frontier Day with full fleet on display, classified security plans. Boy, they're really swinging for the fences with this, aren't they? So anyway, we're now back to Rafi. Vulcan crime lord is telling Rafi, you work for me now, Starfleet. And he threatens her family. And then of course, Worf isn't dead. So he gets up and he kills all of Vulcan's guys. Apparently he has mastered the Kalis technique of being able to slow down his heartbeat to make it imperceptible. So, okie dokie. So, then the Vulcan spills his guts. He's telling them that the Daystrom system, the security system, had illogical flaws in it. And he has a device that can exploit those flaws. And they'll be able to break into Daystrom using this device. So, then we're back to Ro and Picard. Ro is telling Picard that he needs to take the Titan and run. She tells Picard that... All these years, she wished that he'd known her, that she'd known him as well, and she gave him her earring. And again, like, this could have been such a great scene, and the scenes between Roe and Picard, they really were the highlight 
of this episode. Of the series. Yeah, actually, yeah, of the series. In fact, I would say the highlight of all of Kurtzman Trek. But unfortunately, it is wrapped up in the rest of the nonsense that's going on. I just, I don't understand. Well, I'll get to the end and complain about this then. Just... Yeah, this I'm, could have been so great. I'm waiting. I've got lots to say, but I know you want to get through your synopsis, so I'm waiting until we get to that analysis part, because I got a lot to say. Picard tells Shaw that they have to run, and of course, Shaw calls for security. Uh, Riker steps in and tells security, belay that order. Picard is telling Shaw, you must trust me. Rose Shuttle leaves. She's heading back to the Intrepid, and her security officers beam away at, to the Titan, and it is obvious they are both changelings, and they left a bomb on the shuttle. Ro hails the Titan. She tells them that her security officers have beamed away, etc., and the Titan is trying to get a transporter lock on her, but apparently there's an inhibitor, so they can't. So she has to get closer to the Titan for them to be able to beam her off her shuttle. Of course, there's no time for her to do that. So she takes a suicide bomber run at the Intrepid's nacelle, Picard asks her for forgiveness. So she she takes out the one nacelle on the Intrepid, which will help the Titan to get away if they're being chased, or when is, is actually it. So the Intrepid tells the Titan to surrender, and Shaw is like, why? I mean, this guy is so thick. He's a captain in Starfleet. Jeez Louise. Riker says, we're being framed. So then they have to talk Shaw into running. Fan favorite Shaw. Yeah, and it's not till the Intrepid is <laughs> gonna start shooting them with torpedoes and phasers that Shaw's finally getting the message that they gotta get out of there. I mean, what an idiot. The changelings that have beamed aboard, there were four of them, they find Jack in the hallway. He isn't that lucky. They tell Jack that they have a transport beacon and that he's gonna be coming with them. Jack has the weird red flash that usually precedes his hallucinations, except this time he attacks the changelings and he takes out all four of them. And it was like watching the show Chuck, if anybody's ever seen that, where he had that programming downloaded into his head and he can do all this stuff without even knowing it. So that was Chuck right there on full display. So Jack is having this weird vision and he sees a red door, which seems to feature in a lot of his visions. Michael Burnham's going to be behind it in the Red Angel suit. You just wait. <laughs> oh, so then the Intrepid fires torpedoes at the Titan. Titan does warp away. Oh, they're coming for us. Who? Everyone! Uh, so just more over the top. Everybody's out to get you. This is just the biggest thing ever. Why does it always have to be some everything is coming to an end crisis? Why can't we just have... Well, anyways, never mind. I'll get to that at the end. So anyways, Riker tells Picard that he's sorry and that he knows that Bro Laren meant a lot to him. Picard says, no, Will, I don't think you do. I don't even think that I did. He shows Riker the earring and, and says, she gave this to me. Why? Riker knows why. And the earring has a data chip on it and it is full of files and it's her entire investigation into... I guess, the changeling incursion into Starfleet. So there's an incoming transmission, and it's Worf. Apparently, Ro Laren had been his handler. He asks where Commander Ro is, and, well, they have to tell him that she's no longer with them. So now we're with Beverly and Jack. She asks him if he's sleeping okay, because she remembers when he was a little kid, and he was afraid to go to sleep because he was afraid of what he would see. And he would have all these horrible nightmares, apparently. Beverly asks Jack, how did you know they were all changelings? And then he says, I didn't. I think there's something very wrong with me. So at the very least, at least Jack as a character is being honest about the fact that he thinks there's something wrong with him. I mean, he hasn't told his mother about the visions or anything like that, but at least he admitted that he has a problem and he's not trying to cover that up, which is usually how these things go. But I'm sure there's some sort of story reason that he's going to have to say these things. So I'm just waiting for that to happen because that's the kind of sloppy writing that these people do to move their plot along. I just, I wish characters were more consistent. I wish that they would pick one 
philosophical issue and explore it in an in-depth way instead of trying to throw in a whole bunch of things, just being very superficial about all of them. And let's make sure there's lots of fighting and explosions and lens flares. So I guess now would be a good time to go back and talk about Roe and Picard. And then after that, we will talk about the stupid thing that the Vulcan said. Back at the end of The Next Generation, the penultimate episode was called Preemptive Strike. And in that episode, Lieutenant Roe was recruited to infiltrate a Maquis cell because she had the background that would make her a plausible candidate for joining the Maquis and they would accept her. So she accepts the assignment. They do indeed accept her. The longer she was with them, the more difficult it became for her because she was there because she had the background that it would take to entice someone to become a Maquis in the first place. And she was sympathetic to the cause before she even got there. As she formed relationships with the people there, it became more and more obvious that she was not going to be able to go through with the assignment. She met with Picard and she tried to call the whole thing off. Uh, she lied to him to do that. Instead of realizing that she needed to be pulled out, Picard threatens her with court-martial and tells her that this is going to happen anyway and sends her back in and sends Riker with her because apparently a babysitter was going to fix the whole thing. She manages to sabotage the ambush that was waiting for the Maquis from Starfleet. She leaves Riker in the shuttle they were in and beams away and she joins up with the Maquis and that was that. So that was the last time we saw Lieutenant Rowe. And I'm trying to remember because it's been a long time since I've watched this. So somebody in the comments, correct me if I get this wrong. The Maquis, I believe, what that was, was there was some border territory that was disputed. And then an agreement happened. I don't remember if it was like a neutral zone or if it was actually, I think it was Cardassian. Cardassian space. Space. Yeah. But these settlers refused to move who were Federation citizens. Mm -hmm. So a resistance formed to fight against that agreement, that treaty, and that was the Maquis. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, if I was living in one of those colonies and they told me, hey, guess what, you're you're under Cardassian rule now and they are harassing you to try to get you to leave and killing your people and things like that, you know what, I probably would have joined up with the Maquis too. When I was watching the TNG episode, and this is a, a bit of a nitpick, this is my interpretation. Again, somebody in the comments, feel free to give your differing view on this. But I didn't necessarily see that Roe was identifying with people because they were fighting injustice. I thought the reason she was bonding was the cell leader that she was infiltrating she was seeing a lot of her father or father figure in that person. And it was reminding her of back when she grew up and she was in those Cardassian camps. And it was bringing up a lot of old memories in her. I didn't take it as she was fighting general injustice. Sure, it was injustice to the Bajoran people that she was fighting. But at the end of that TNG episode, she said something like she finally found a place where she felt like she belonged. And I just assumed it was because this was a continuation of that Bajoran resistance against the Cardassians. Yeah, she grew up in the camps under Cardassian occupation. So she reverted back to what she had known as a kid. This, this is what her life was. And I can understand why she would go back to fighting against the Cardassians. She was always uncomfortable throughout the entire series being in Starfleet. So my interpretation of that episode was she finally realized Starfleet just isn't for me. I was born resisting the Cardassians. I'm going to die resisting the Cardassians. Yeah. That was my interpretation. So in this episode, when she was saying, well, I just wanted to fight injustice and the 
I don't know. I just that line to me came across like she was some sort of superhero that wanted to fight all the injustices in the universe, and it was to me, no, you were reverting back. You never felt right in Starfleet, but finding a group that still wanted to fight the Cardassians, yeah, that felt at home to you. That's why you wanted to do that. So when she gave that line in this episode, I mean, it wasn't a big thing, and one could argue, well, injustice is in parenthetical. Yeah, yeah, the Bajoran injustices. Sure, but just that line just kind of hit me wrong in the Picard episode. She chose to fight for her people instead of giving all of that up for Starfleet. Well, I'm not even sure it was to fight for her people because a lot of those people weren't Bajoran. She wanted to fight Cardassians. Well, yeah. So anybody fighting Cardassians is what she wanted to do. But I think that the Bajoran identity at that point had become so intertwined with resisting the Cardassians that you couldn't have it without that. Because that was her experience growing up. The Cardassians killed her father. Uh, She grew up in the camps under their rule. I think as a Bajoran, she wasn't able to let go of that. And frankly, why should she? You saw in Deep Space Nine, Kira, even though she never was in Starfleet, she had trouble doing things the Starfleet way because that also was ingrained. In fact, if I remember, and somebody correct me, this is a piece of trivia, I thought that I heard that in Deep Space Nine, Michelle Forbes' row was supposed to be Major Kira's role. But because Michelle Forbes, the actress, there was some conflict or something, she couldn't do the series. Yeah, she got a job on a different show. And that's why they created the Major Kira character. I don't know 100% if that's true, but that's the rumor I heard. I bring that up because Kira and Ro have such a very similar background, which a lot of the Bajoran people had that similar background. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, I mean, for me, I felt Picard was wrong in Preemptive Strike when he didn't pull her out of that situation. He should have recognized that she was in over her head. He was threatening court martial yeah. and stuff on her. It's like, what are you doing? And this was in the TNG series. Yeah, as her mentor, that was absolutely the wrong thing to do. Honestly, he should have been reflecting on that for the last 30 years. He should have felt guilty because a lot of this was his fault. If he had just pulled her out instead of sending her back in, they might have been able to save her. But no, that's not what happened. So he should have been apologizing to her. But again, it's all ridiculous because why would they let her back in Starfleet, especially in intelligence, after that? Because that's twice. (laughs) That's twice that they did that for her. They had intense training this time. Oh, God. The sad thing is, if they would have created a different reason in the writing for Picard to come across Roe, like they found her on a abandoned ship or an asteroid mining facility or something. And then the conversations that happened in the holodeck happened. This would be really, really good. But that's not what they did. Why couldn't she have been some sort of smuggler that they could have gotten in touch with to give them that contact with the underworld that they needed to find whoever it was that Sneed was working with? Instead of that stupid Vulcan crime lord. That would have made a lot more sense if she was still, even after 30 years, trying to make life miserable for Cardassians. Or even if Jack Crusher, when he was doing his smuggling of those things, if he came across Roe in that situation. Yeah. There were so many story ideas you could have come up with that would have reintroduced the Roe character in a reasonable way. I rejected this rogue character as being an imposter. Not a changeling, just an imposter, like Molly said at the beginning of this video. There was that nice moment in the holodeck between Picard and Roe, but the context around it was garbage. I never believed it was plausible for Roe to be back. Any secret intelligent agency that would accept Roe back there's something wrong with them. But that that's Star Trek now. It's all dark government conspiracies because this season is being set up. So remember the changelings from Deep Space Nine and how they were infiltrating stuff, but not really a whole bunch, but enough to scare people? Remember conspiracy at TNG? In fact, when Roe 
was having that conversation with Picard in the holodeck. That was so similar to when those captains met in the conspiracy episode of TNG on that planet. And they were talking about how things just weren't lining up. It's like Terry Matalas took those two story ideas and smooshed them together and came up with this. I did appreciate some things, like Ro wanted to talk openly. So her saying, let's go to the holodeck, because the holodeck would be a difficult place to bug due to the holographic nature of it. Like, that actually, plausibly, that made sense to me. And if they would have walked into the holodeck and it just had that normal grid when it's not initialized... And then maybe they created some scene somewhere, not 10 forward. (laughs) Like maybe something that Rowan Picard had in common. Like maybe she recreated that place, that colony, that in preemptive strike where she was sent. And then they could have that conversation. Like there was so much potential here for something good, but they didn't do that. So I give them credit for the two-minute conversation where Picard was explaining his side of what happened in Preemptive Strike and Roe was giving her side, even though I don't think her side was 100% accurate. That was a nice scene. Too bad the rest of it wasn't. Yeah, because it would have been interesting if Roe was in charge of that community now that she had left Starfleet for all those years ago. And wouldn't it have been interesting if she and Beverly Crusher had worked together with smuggling medical supplies. I mean, that would have been an interesting thing if it turned out that she and Beverly had had this relationship for the last 20 years. Because that could have been another interesting thing that Beverly had been doing instead of she's just there for the alien autopsy. Or she could have been a conduit, a a go-between between Picard and Roe. Because it could have been another secret she'd been keeping from Picard. I mean, there are so many things they could have done with this instead of what they did do. It was lazy to put her back into Starfleet and come up with excuses as to why she was there. I'm sure some people would be like, oh, well, it was the changelings who put her in there because they wanted to disrupt things. Well, they did a shit job, didn't they? Because she collected all this evidence and now she's turned it over to Picard and Riker. Even the collecting (laughs) evidence, when we saw that Riker figured out that her earring had all this data on it, Molly brought this up, so I can't take credit. She said, remember in the first season of The Expanse when that Martian ambassador committed suicide and they were questioning where the stealth technology and this other force was coming from? We found these pencils, and on one of the ends of the pencils was the same type of thing. There was data for... I don't remember, was it schematics for engines or stealth or it was something? Yeah, yeah, it was it was for the engines, the stealth technology. It reminded us so much when she brought that up, I'm like, yep, that's where that came from. Was it a horrible scene? No, because I could go along with that for what it was, but it did remind us of something else, and that's this whole season. Well, it was a trope. It, yeah, it just reminds me of older stuff. There's nothing new here. Yeah. Let's talk about the Vulcan for a second, because after that, I would like to give you what I think, where this series might be going, and I'm not real happy about saying this is where I think it's going. So with that Vulcan, the mobster guy, that one line he did of, with the utopia, you need crime. I'm sorry, anybody who's a Trekkie worth their weight would see that as a slap right across the face. Right along with that first episode, which I let go when Riker said, well, nobody wants the fat ship, and then later on said it was something like, nobody wants to hear somebody drone on for 250 years or whatever that line was. About 250 years of going where no man has gone before, whatever it was. It's these little things are sticking in this series, which is slapping the face of any old Trekkie. And this Vulcan saying that, it irritated me. Now, I understand that if you have a system set up where you're given basic necessities, you need more than that. You would go to a black market to obtain whatever else you need. So, you know, I I don't want to go into modern politics, but that's one of the downsides of these large communist empires that were around was they forced through an authoritarian source They made you comply with being this communist entity. And so if you wanted anything more than what they gave you for basic living, you had to go to a black market. This isn't that. The Federation, this this is not that. 
I don't understand this political divide we have in this country. We've got warp engines. We've got impulse engines. We've got phasers. None of those we have now. Yet somehow we have some sort of modern communism in Star Trek. Is it possible there's some other system in place in Star Trek that's not modern communism? You don't have to speak out against that because that's not what Star Trek is. It irritated me because with replicators, you don't need a black market because the replicators give you what you want. They have endless energy sources in Star Trek, which power the replicators. You don't need that. When he said that line, that utopias require crime, it's logical, that, I mean, I got mad. My face got red. I got really irritated. I think this just comes back to... What I've been saying for quite some time, either you have a negative view of humanity or a positive view of humanity. Either you believe that if people have all of their needs met, then there is no reason for them to turn to crime, or you think that people are just so inherently bad that they'll turn to crime anyway, even if they already have everything. Which I would argue, if that's the case, if you do turn to crime, even though you have your needs met, then that's mental illness. And there would be treatment for that. So I just, I'm really sick of this negative view of humanity. This is the dystopia that we have been complaining about for, well, basically ever since Kurtzman Trek hit the screen. That's what they're implying here, is that in Kurtzman Trek, most people are evil crap. And only a select few are enlightened enough against that. Oh, everybody's flawed. So everything is horrible. And I'm just, I'm so tired of this moral relativism. Done with it. Because this brings me to my next comment. Why can't we pick just one philosophical question and tackle that in an in-depth way instead of, again, throwing a dozen different things at you and not exploring a single one of them. For instance, what the Vulcan said, a utopia requires crime. How? How? Don't just say that. How? My argument would be if you need crime, then it wasn't a utopia to begin with because it defeats the purpose of what a utopia is. Well, it's these idiots that say that you can't have good unless you have evil to show you what good is as a counterpoint to good. Yeah, but and what they would say is most are bad. Most are dark. Only a select few are good. That's so anti-Star Trek. Well, all of this is anti-Star Trek. You've got these Section 31s running around. I used to... I did not care for that in Deep Space Nine. In fact, there's a lot I didn't care for in Deep Space Nine, but I know that's going to spark off stuff in the comments. There's a lot I did like, though, so I'm not saying I didn't like Deep Space Nine. But this Section 31, I get the argument of, fine, you people get along, but there are foreign entities that are going to threaten you, and we need intelligence to go and take care of that. Fine. Why do you need Section 31? Starfleet has its own intelligence stuff. We don't need Section 31 for that. And now they're pointing Section 31 into our own Federation. And they would make the argument, Kurtzman, I'm sure, well, yeah, that mirrors what's happening in the U.S. right now with all the CIA and FBI and all. But this isn't that. We're supposed to be in the enlightened future. I don't want to watch that. I see enough of that right now. Star Trek was supposed to be this utopia to which we could aspire. These were supposed to be better people. These were supposed to be better times. It was supposed to be something to strive for. It wasn't supposed to be a reflection of what we're going through right now. And if there was a reflection of that, it was supposed to be shown to us through other societies, not through Starfleet and the Federation. They were supposed to come upon people who were doing things in a way that needed some fixing. And we were supposed to view that behavior through allegory, not a direct comparison between what is going on right now and, oh, looky, it's still going on in the future. Well, I guess there's no reason to fight it. This season has been said to be broken into three serials. We just finished the four-episode first serial, and it had some ridiculous stuff. I just have to show you a screenshot of a floating head 
yelling at the penguin. Or I can just show you a starship throwing another starship at a yet a third starship. <laughs> I can show you visuals that are stupid. I mean, just so ridiculous that you just can't help but laugh. This was the beginning of the next serial. I will say it felt different. There is not a screenshot I can show that looks stupid where I can say, look at that, that's ridiculous. It had a much different tone to it. And I was hoping we were going to get a more serious take on this subject. Well, we're not getting the ridiculous stuff yet, but I just explained this episode had stuff in it. If you believe in a dystopian Star Trek, you think that's the cool thing, you're probably going to love this series because I think that's the divide right now. We've been asking people, how can people be liking this series when we're watching it and it's garbage? And I think that's it. There are people, and I'm so proud of the people we have on our comment area and our subscribers, who look at Star Trek as that aspirational place. Yes, there are some dark turns that happen, but overall we prevail. It's a positive thing. And those people who are praising this, I think they're used to this glum, dreary... I could make the argument, if you love New Battlestar Galactica, you'll probably like this, because I didn't like New Battlestar Galactica. I liked the miniseries that began the thing, and on and off, I saw a couple of good episodes. Love the visual effects. Didn't like the story very much. But that dystopian post-9-11 crap. Are you a defeatist or are you an optimist? And I think that's where the line's being drawn here. I guess I'll say now, I have some predictions of what's going to happen because I just mentioned New Battlestar Galactica. What I think's going to happen, because they mentioned in this episode, Roe mentioned to Picard, that Frontier Day is coming up. The fleet is going to meet in one place to celebrate, and the security plans aren't being shown. We know uh, LaForge's character, LeVar Burton, is going to be coming into the series. And we know he is running the Fleet Museum. So here's where I think they're going with this. I think during that event, that Frontier Day event, Starfleet's going to be all in that one place. There's going to be an attack in the Federation. And I think LaForge, much like in New Battlestar Galactica, when the fleet was attacked there... And Starbuck was going through the museum pieces to get the old Vipers out to protect the, what was left of the, uh, the fleet in Galactica. I think that what I'm predicting is going to happen is during Frontier Day, there's going to be an attack. All the fleet's going to either be disabled or so far away they can't help. And what they're going to do is they're going to go to the fleet museum like Starbuck went in the, that museum to get those old Vipers. We're going to see the Enterprise D again. We might even see Voyager again and maybe something else. And those old ships are going to come through and they're going to save the day. They did say that the whole fleet is going to be on display for Frontier Day. And that kind of mirrors the 1978 Battlestar Galactica when they had all of their fleet together to sign some peace treaty with the Cylons. And the Cylons took that as an opportunity to attack not just the fleet all in one place, but also... Well, they sent their fighters being fueled by tankers at the fleet. And then they sent their base stars to the planets to take out the planets. Yeah. So, going forward, it really looks like this story is probably going to be a mashup of both versions of Battlestar Galactica. And I have a second prediction here. Molly mentioned this earlier. I think Jack is a changeling. I think Jack demonstrated in that hallway that he's a changeling. And those flashes that are happening are memories of some previous iteration of him. I think it's also a possibility that he is only part changeling. Like when he was a little kid, he needed a blood transfusion or an organ or something. Or maybe he just accidentally ate one. But I think he has changeling inside of him. That perhaps he is mostly human, but there's part changeling in there as well. Well, my prediction is I think he's full changeling. I think what happened was I think Jack Crusher died at an early age. And I think this changeling took his identity and has been with Beverly Crusher for a large part of his life. That's my prediction. I think there's two similarities here. One is when Odo talks about when he was found... His memories of his previous era were cloudy when he was thinking, you know, he couldn't really remember the link and the founders and all that. 
But two, and I mentioned this to Molly, in the 90s, there was a follow-up to the Batman animated series called The New Adventures of Batman and Robin. And there was this episode called Growing Pains. And Clayface had an accident where he was hurt and he needed to find resources. So he took out a piece of him and he made a little girl out of it. And then that little girl went out to try to get what Clayface needed. And during that time, she forgot who she was and she took on this new identity. I think that's what Jack Crusher is. I think Jack Crusher is a changeling that replaced Jack Crusher at an early age. I don't think Beverly knows that. Because, obviously, if he did replace Jack at an early age, he would have went through medical tests. But I think there's a changeling. The changeling grew as a human would grow. That's my suspicion. Molly has a good one, too. But I'm suspecting it's basically redoing the Growing Pains Batman animation from the 1990s. That's what I think Jack is. (laughs) Either way, Jack is changeling. I'm glad this is the last season of this crap. Because I, people say this is so much better. It's really not that much better. I don't think it is better. Outside of that row scene, that itty-bitty two-minute moment, I disagree with people who say that this is demonstrably better than what's come before in Kurtzman Trek. I, do I think it's worse? I mean, I don't think it's any worse other than they're crapping on legacy characters now. But the stories are just as ridiculous. I do not understand why people like this. It doesn't seem any different than Discovery or the earlier seasons of Picard. It really doesn't. The stories are just as ridiculous. Well, there's a reason for that. Because Terry Madalus was one of the showrunners on season two. All of these episodes for season three were all written by people who wrote for previous seasons of Picard. Yes, there are two writers who weren't around on the previous seasons, but they were paired up with people who were. So none of these episodes are written by somebody who didn't already work on Star Trek Picard. All of them have at least one writer on them who was responsible for the crap that came before. Why are people walking around, well, online, and asserting this is an entirely different staff making this stuff? It's not. This is not. Go to, don't believe us. Go to IMDb. Look where Terry Madalus came from. Look at the writers working on this stuff now. Cause Molly's right. Yeah, you'll see a new writer, but the new writer isn't writing alone. It's being paired with a writer who worked on this stuff before. So I don't know why people are asserting that, hey, this is an all new thing. It's like, no, it's not. Ah, uh, because they've been led to believe that it is. And they have been misled. So, yeah. Overall, I would say this was the least awful episode. In my opinion, this was the best of season three of Picard. But, as we pointed out, it's got loads of problems. Yeah, and especially after watching the preemptive strike episode from TNG right before we watched this, the difference was so stark between the two, just the the coloring, the lighting, the acting, the story. If you want to watch something good, watch that instead. Because I I like the actress who plays Rolaren. I like the character of Rolaren. If you want to see her character done justice, then go back and watch Preemptive Strike or any of the other episodes she was in in TNG. They were so much better than this. Concur. So, what did you guys think? Did you see the same things we saw in this episode? Was there anything we didn't mention? Obviously, this this review has gotten rather long, so we're just going to have to cut it off there. Yeah, we saw a lot of problems. So let us know what you saw in the comments below. Take care.